evening and welcome to the journey home. It's open line, that first episode of the month in which you even play a, a more important role in this program because as soon as we have emails and phone calls uh, registered, we want to give as much time to you to ask your questions of uh, tonight's guest. And tonight's guest is a familiar face on EWTN, Paul Thigpen. Uh, this is third time on the journey home at uh, least? Fourth, I think. Okay, yeah. all right. Well, the other reason Paul is here is that uh, he is uh, here also to join me for tomorrow morning and when we'll be uh, taping another edition of the Journey Home Roundtable special, which hopefully you'll start seeing in the fall. You'll hear more about that as the fall approaches. Uh, special roundtable tomorrow on Methodists. And you, uh, Paul will be joined with Gordon Sibley and Chris Dixon uh, for the panel. But Paul, it's great to have you in the Journey Home. It's always a pleasure to have you here. Give you the usual handshake. Thank you, Marcus. You here. It is good to be uh, here. We were good just thinking when was the first time we met uh, because we're both converts to the church and and uh, I think you mentioned you were one of the charter members of the Coming Home Network. It right? was after Defending the Faith Conference in Steubenville. You had uh, you made an announcement that uh, you were interested in getting together with other converts, clergy converts. Let's have a dinner. We got together. The Hans were there. That's right. Other folks and Father, that first little Father group. Scanlon, that was yeah. way back in '93, and now here we are. Really, this was our 12th summer, and uh, things are the Holy Spirit is still growing. And, and really, it was out of that that the Coming Home Network developed, and then it was in talking about the Coming Home Network that Mother Angelica invited me to host this program to talk with converts each week. And uh, but the other thing, uh, you've got a new job title, right? I certainly do. I'm having the time of my life as editor of the Catholic Answer. It's a national bi-monthly magazine published by our Sunday Visitor. It uh, answers questions about the Catholic faith and I'm um, having a great time. It's a good tool of evangelization, but also catechesis and apologetics, a whole lot of other things. Yeah. It has some regular columns by some of the most astute writers in the world, <laughs> right? Yes, we just added a columnist <laughs> named Marcus Grodi, actually. It's uh, one of my favorites, so that's right. Only the most humble of writers. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, thank you. I, I mean, I appreciate the privilege of being invited to do well, that. Well, we love having you. Yeah. With all that being aside, the other th reason that you and I were connected was that you were story number one. I think I was story number two in, in uh, Pat Madrid's first edition of Surprised by Truth. That's right. And so that's where we were connected. Uh, but with every open line program, I always invite the guests to give us a real quick summary of your journey. If the audience wants a longer version, you can either buy the old tape of the Journey Home program or go to Surprised by Truth. But why don't you give us a s synopsis, if you would, Paul? Well, it's always so hard to know where to start. I was raised <laughs> in a Presbyterian home. As, uh, I guess you were Presbyterian for a while, and uh, became an atheist at the age of 12. Wow. Had been reading some skeptical philosophers like uh, Voltaire from the Enlightenment and others that some teachers had put in my hands in, in history class. And uh, being an arrogant, arrogant little kid, decided that religion was just uh, a creation of, of humankind to try to feel better about the world. And I remained an atheist for six years until I was 18 had a number of uh, experiences I could not explain that uh, convinced me that there was more to the world than just matter and energy, that there was a supernatural realm. And in fact, we, our first program together That's right. that I was on, we talked about that. Well, that was a show that almost didn't air. Yes, I can imagine why. Well, I remember the probably. devil didn't want you to talk about those <laughs> issues. Right. I remember that program, yeah. Sure. Yes, and so it, uh, that had shocked me out of my, my comfortable little world thinking that, that science was the end of, of everything. I uh, also though, began to engage in prayer as uh, an experiment, see if, if maybe there really was somebody out there answering. Mm -hmm. Began to have some remarkable answers to prayer. A whole series of events came together. I began to read C.S. Lewis, uh, mm -hmm. familiar probably to most of your audience, and other writers who uh, helped me to get over the intellectual obstacles to becoming Christian. Mm -hmm. That was uh, the age of 18. Uh, after that, it was a number of years of growing spiritually, coming close, closer to our Lord, but still wandering in many ways, uh, feeling like something was missing. Mm -hmm. I like to talk of myself as a walking ecumenical movement. I uh, <laughs> led a youth group in a Baptist church. My parents became Baptist. I taught Sunday school in an Episcopal church. I belonged to the Assemblies of God, several different charismatic, non-denominational churches. I was Methodist for some years. I had been Presbyterian. And uh, finally, though, as I started a graduate program, a PhD in, in church history, historical theology, that's when things began to open up for me. As I began to look at the early church, I began to see that a, a great deal of what I'd been taught or 
had assumed about the early Christians was not true, that the, the early church was Catholic mm -hmm. and all the ways that were important to me, that the early church, the fathers who wrote about the Eucharist wrote about it as the body and blood of our Lord, not as a symbol. They had bishops, they had priests, they had uh, all kinds of things that I had always dismissed as, as not important to Christianity. Mm -hmm. So by the end of my, my doctoral program, that and, and uh, a growing hunger for the Eucharist, some other things, uh, I entered the Catholic Church 11 years ago, 1993. And of course, one issue about the early church is they certainly were not scripture alone. Oh my goodness, well, especially in the early, early church that the scripture wasn't settled yet. It was still being written for a generation after our Lord's life on earth. And then after that, uh, the church had to, someone had to sort it out and say, all these books claim to be inspired by God. These are the ones that really are. And uh, in a sense, to, to judge scripture, not in, a, not in a haughty way, but the church was given the authority by God to discern. In fact, you talk about this area with issue of soul scriptura. You said that there was a need to discern which were spiritually inspired. But I didn't realize back when I was a Protestant pastor uh, and for the first 40 years of my life, that really the, the issue was, it, this is not true, that really the issue was which of these books uh, ought to be read in liturgy. I mean, wasn't yes. that really the issue? Yes, because there, there was a big difference between what was read in liturgy and what might be read for spiritual comfort or encouragement or enlightenment outside. And the, the big challenge then came, of course, from the, the arch heretic Marcion, who claimed that he Which had... Which was when, about? He was, he was late first century there, okay. so he's early second century. Around that period, his movement began growing. And he was saying that, uh, that actually he, could, he was the one who could discern the canon, and he posited two gods, an Old Testament God, a New Testament God. The Old Testament God was, was really not good. He was a God of law and, and justice only. The New Testament God was our Father who was loving. And therefore, the, the only canon, the only scriptures we should have are those parts of the New Testament that have had the Old Testament parts taken out. The Old Testament was rejected. And uh, the church looked at that and said, okay, we, we really do have to have some kind of, of list going on. So it, uh, it took a while to develop that, yeah. of course. And the reason I brought it up that way is that often uh, you know, we, at least when I was an evangelical, we always thought about the Bible as more of a personal thing. Something yes. I did in my personal study, everyone ought to have a Bible, you know, this one's got a little handle on the bottom, you know, a Bible that you'd read and you'd study and you'd read every day, and that's great. I mean, we encourage everyone out there to take time in scriptures. The church encourages that, gives an indulgence for those that would read uh, 30 minutes a day, so it's an important thing. But in reality, in the early days, there was no personal Bibles for anyone. It was which books ought to be read in mass. And for the first 300 years, it wasn't only the canonical books. The Shepherd of Hermas right. was read, the Letter of First Clement, some of the other Gospels, other Acts. Uh, we have a number of lists, right, that included books that aren't in our canon, and some of the books that are in our canon were, were rejected. So that's what it came down to. Which of the books were inspired canonical literature? And that brings us to this issue. You mentioned even in your early journey that one of the issues that brought you away from Christian faith when you were 12 years old was a history class. You know, there you got That's introduced right. into uh, atheism, atheistic philosophy through a history class, and that's what grabbed you. But also later, it was your study of history that brought you back. Remember, Newman makes that statement to become deep in history as it ceased to be Protestant. Talk about the importance, the significance of being deeper, deep in history. In, the, in your spiritual journey? Well, I think it's, it's fair to say that American culture as a whole has a kind of historical myopia. We're nearsighted when it comes to history. It's, uh, American religious history is my specialty, and there are lots of reasons for that. The American culture has always tended to focus on the now and the future and what can we do, uh, and not to be so interested in the past. Uh, the quintessential American Henry Ford who said history is bunk. And uh, so you see, see that attitude in American culture, and. Many folks here ha have adopted that idea. But the truth is that we, we all have our roots in history. Who we are is shaped by where we've been, that every individual is shaped by their parents, shaped by their grandparents, the culture out of which they've come. And cultures aren't, aren't something that come and go in a day. They're something that are built over centuries. 
and uh, especially that's so with the church, with church history. I think there was an ancient Greek philosopher who once said that philosophy is, is one thing, but history is also important because history is philosophy teaching by example. Yeah. And I think church history, you could say, is theology teaching by example. When we read church history, we begin to find, what I begin to find, is that so many of the questions we have today were answered by the church a long time ago. That so many of the things that, uh, problems we get into, were problems the church faced before, and we can learn lessons. In fact, you mentioned Marcion, when, when you described him in such cold terms, you know, in other words, he, he saw the Old Testament God this way and the New Testament God that way, it makes him sound so different than, let's say, pastors who might re meet on the street today. But in reality, when you read the history, he was a very winsome preacher. That's why he, he uh, attracted many, many people, convinced other preachers. He was very winsome, and there was a very fine line in his theology. And it took a while for people to realize where he was leading. And that brought it back to the authority of the church. Something else struck me today as I was flying here about this history. I was reading in a national news magazine and it, apparently in the a weekly national news magazine, and the week before there had been an article about the United Methodists and how they had st stood strong against same-sex marriages, which is great. Well, in this issue, in the letters of the editor, there was a, someone wrote in and said, I appreciated the article about the United Methodists. However, they got their, their, their data wrong. And, he said, actually, the Southern Baptists were the first mainline denomination to take a stand against same-sex marriage. And he said, I ought to know, you know, I'm an ethicist at some South Southern Baptist seminary. And I wanted to write in, excuse me, but the Catholic Church has been against same-sex marriages for about 2,000 years. I mean, get your history right. Yes. <laughs> I mean, talk about myopia. <clears throat> but how does one become deep in history? Because, I mean, there was an example of you as a young man getting history and that took you off in the wrong direction. And we know of historians, like the guy that wrote that letter to the editor that was deep in history, but he had a, a big part of it wrong. Well, I think for a lot of folks today, several things we could say. One is that because Americans are so myopic when it comes to, to history, that when you talk about history, they often think you mean back 100 or 200 years. That, that, now, this is not a joke, but I actually had a friend one time who said, oh, I love the church fathers. I love to read about them. And I said, oh, really? Which one do you like most? Uh, he was uh, Pentecostal. And he said, uh, Charles Finney. Now, <laughs> Charles Finney was an American revivalist who lived in the 1800s. And for him, that's what a church father was. And, and so we talked a little bit about how there's a lot more church history there than just that much. But uh, other things, too. I, our culture tends not only to not to think about the past, but they dismiss it because they, they tend to think that somehow in our generation, we have reached some kind of peak or some kind of higher level than all the generations before us that because we're better technologically, because we have more science or we have more body of knowledge, that somehow we're wiser, somehow we're closer to the deeper realities, and that earlier generations were all just superstitious and stupid. And that's part of the problem, is that you can come to history and you can read it and think, oh yeah, well sure these people talk about deliverances from demons, sure these people talk about hierarchy and authority and the, bloody, with the, the body and blood uh, of Christ, but they were they lived hundreds of years ago. They were superstitious. They didn't know the science we do. So that if you only have historical knowledge, but you don't come to history with a certain humility, recognizing that earlier generations have a great deal to teach us and that we have our own blindnesses in many ways, then you can read an awful lot of history and still not get what history has to teach you. You know, just thinking, I often get the question on where do I begin with early church fathers and there's any number of sources which we've mentioned over the years on this program, but one just came to, to mind that uh, would encourage you to take time to do the daily office of readings mm -hmm. every day. Uh, four years, uh, uh, no, excuse me, yes, uh, two years, right? Is it circle of two years? No, it's one year cycle for the mm -hmm. office of readings, but for every day of the year and feast days, and you can uh, get a copy of that in the four volume uh, Liturgy of the Hours, or I'm pretty sure the Daughters of St. Paul have a one volume just the office of readings. But the beauty of that is the church has chosen readings of the early fathers, of the uh, uh, writings of Vatican II, a variety of, of authors throughout the last 2,000 years that will give you a flavor for, ver the beauty of it is, is when we start to think we're so smart today, and you read what some of these authors wrote in the second, third, fourth, fifth century, 
and realize their depth of wisdom. It's it, remarkable. It, I, <laughs> I get questions in the, in the magazine as editor there. I get questions from people in my Bible study weekly. And I find myself almost always answering them with a quote from one of the church fathers because you don't have to go any further than that for most of the answers. They, they were brilliant men. They were close to God. They had uh, great infilling of the Holy Spirit. He, the, the Lord brought them incredible wisdom as a gift of the Spirit. And I'm not saying that, that everything we need to know is in the Father's, of course, but there's so much we can find there where you, you, yeah. don't, you don't have to search any further. Let's take our first caller. Hello, Peter from Wisconsin. Hello, what's your question tonight? Uh, yes, my question is for Paul. Um, being that he was an atheist at one time and, and is now uh, Catholic, uh, if you were approached by an atheist, you know, and, and they said, you know, what about God? You know, what, what is God? You know, uh, you know, wh who is he? What is he? You know, wh what's the first thing that would come to your mind uh, to, to say, uh, for either one of you, for that matter? Thanks, Peter. Mm -hmm. Thanks for the fine question. That's good. Peter, uh, there have been some theologians who have spoken of God as... Uh, that which nothing is greater than. And that's, that sounds like a rather abstract way to d describe it. But I guess if I were to talk to someone about what, what I believe and who I believe God to be, then I would have to start there, that all the things around us that we see, feel, touch, hear, that they come and they go, there's a, there's a, a passing, a, a temporality about them. They move through time, uh, a corruptibility about them, that they, they have a time of ending. But that... Uh, and that such things cannot come about on their own. They have to have their source in something that itself doesn't come and go, that doesn't, uh, doesn't have the ability to corrupt or become less than it was. And that that's what God is and that that's who God is. And that the, the amazing thing is that the, the ground in which everything else finds its origin is not just a thing but a person. And that's what sets us apart uh, Christ the Christian revelation from so many of the claims of some of the Eastern religions that it's not just a, a force or an energy field of some kind, but that there's actually a person uh, from whom all other persons derive their personhood after whom they've, they've been made in his image. And so that's how I'd begin to talk anyway, to ask him how can there be the things that, that are to come about by themselves on their own, uh, to have the kind of order that they do. It's, again, it's a very old argument you, you find it in early times. That there but must we, be but someone that's, but that's the at the very beginning. Though, isn't it, though? I mean, that is the, the oldest argument, even though many 18th, 19th century philosophers kind of poo-pooed the argument from design. But yet, isn't that the cause and effect? One of the well, in information theory now, for instance, yeah. in science, they're beginning to show that if, if you look at uh, the mathematics of it, the probability that we could have the kind of information built into DNA, for instance, that we do is so extremely high that in any other situation, if we were to say it's by chance, then, then people would laugh at us. Yeah. It's, it's not random, it's not chance. Yeah. Which is part of the reason why many scientists are looking, are digging deeper for something you know, invisible out there, you know, something that uh, gives meaning to. And that's why many scientists are believers too. That's right, exactly. So. Right. Let's go to the next caller, Richard in Rhode Island. Hello, Richard, what's your question? Hi, thank you, I enjoy the show. Thank you. Um, I have never been able to understand why is the body and blood presence of Christ necessary in the Eucharist? Why can't it just be symbolic like it's taught in a lot of the Protestant circles? Right. I've never been able to get a good answer to that question. Richard, thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Richard. I think it's important for us, first of all, to recognize that when the, the Catholic Church teaches something, they don't teach it because they think it's necessary for something else, but they teach it because they, it's true. And uh, it, Jesus could have given us uh, a symbolic Eucharist, but Jesus didn't give us a symbolic Eucharist. He gave us his real presence. He gave us his real body, blood, soul, and divinity there. And when we know that, then, of course, there are all kinds of things we learn about it, the, the grace, the glory that comes to us through that, which makes us very glad that he didn't just give us a symbol. But, uh, I, you know, I've, I've seen the, this kind of idea sometimes in, in other situations, too, where, for instance, people will say, well, why did God have to uh, have Mary immaculately conceived? Well, I don't know that he had to do it. Uh, theologians have discussed that for a long time. The church doesn't make that claim that it has to be, had to be that way, but simply that it is the way God did it and that God revealed that to the church and the church has given testimony and dogmatically defined it. So I think it's the same way with the body and blood. Now, maybe in, in God's own mind, his own mind, there are reasons 
uh, why I've perhaps given other things that it was necessary. When Jesus said, for instance, uh, it is necessary that the Son of Man die uh, to, to save us, theologians have argued, okay, was it necessary? Is there really anything necessary? Did it have to be for God? And I think uh, folks like St. Augustine and others said, well, at, at one level, no, there's nothing that God has to do except to be true to himself, to, to be consistent with his own nature and character. On the other hand, if God chooses to do something a certain way, then other things become necessary. Once God chose to give us free will, once he chose to allow us the fall, once he chose to lift us up out of uh, our situation and to unite us to his own nature, then the incarnation became, yes, became necessary, and Jesus' sacrifice and death. We had dinner tonight with uh, Chris Dixon as we were preparing for tomorrow. One of the discussions that he brought up was this, uh, the struggle amongst the mainline Protestant denominations that many of them have drifted to a more liberal social action perspective. And when you have the more evangelical elements within, trying to draw them back to you know, the more uh, issues of the faith that were more traditional, the answer is often, you know, don't rock the boat, don't cause division. And, and, and again, that gets back to this issue of what's true versus, well, do we water it down to try and appease changes of culture, you know, changes of, of, of mental climate, or do we hold on to what's true and trust that the Spirit, uh, you know, will bring charity, and hopefully we, we can defend truth with charity uh, and take the suffering if it comes. Let's take this email from Michael in Illinois. Eight years ago, the United Methodist Church adapt, adopted a document stating its position on the sacrament of baptism. This year it adopted a document stating its position on Holy Communion. In many quarters, the UMC is looking to regain the traditions of the church that were lost by evangelical Protestantism. What, if any, dialogue is going on between the Roman Catholic Church and the United Methodist Church on this matter? Thank you, Michael. Are you familiar with those well, documents? Well, yeah, yeah, I'm familiar with the documents. I'm, I don't, uh, don't know the details of what the church is doing in ecumenical dialogue with Methodists. I, I do know it all over the place. You have lots of individual things. When I was back in Springfield, Missouri, we were having uh, dialogue with uh, the Assemblies of God and other Pentecostals. So I'm sure there are Methodist groups uh, getting together with the Catholic Church as well. But I, we'll probably talk more about this in the program we're going to tape tomorrow. tomorrow. But, but I do believe that uh, in some segments of the Protestant world there's, a, there's been a rediscovery of certain foundational elements, Catholic faith from the beginning, and that in fact the, the Wesleyan movements were themselves a turn away from certain elements of, of Calvinism and other kinds of Protestant tradition back toward a more Catholic way of looking at things in certain ways. A reaction against the Calvinist movements that had developed in, in the Anglican Church, mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. and so it was a return to, the, to the, even the Catholic groups of the Anglican Church. All right, let's take this next email. This is Ron in New Jersey. Dear Marcus and Dr. Thigpen, some Protestants believe the Catholic Church lost its moral authority at some point in history, Inquisition, for example, and that the Reformation gave birth to the Church in a new form. What arguments are there against this position? Thank you, Ron. Well, to, to argue that someone has lost moral authority, you have to argue not just that they have had a moral lapse themselves, but you have to argue that uh, the moral authority they've been given wasn't really given to them. Now, let me be a little more explicit. If Jesus did establish the Catholic Church, if he did give authority to teach and to judge moral behavior to the church, as the church claims and as I believe history bears out, then the fact that an individual pope or a whole group of popes or a series of popes or bishops or others, the kind of moral lapses we've seen in recent times, the fact that they may personally fail morally does not mean that uh, that they can't teach moral truth because primarily because the moral truth isn't based in themselves they're not arriving at that moral truth by, by basing it on their own experience if I taught morally only by what I knew from my own experience then whenever my experience went wrong whenever I failed terribly morally I'd, I'd be in trouble but if I am passing on to others a moral tradition that has come down to me authoritatively from the church then the authority basically is based in the tradition as it goes through the magisterium, not based on the personal f failings or, or successes morally of the individuals. If you uh, look at history, of course, there have been failings like the Inquisition and, and other things where you, lots of people in one particular period. But the truth is, uh, if, if that were a problem, then there would be no, no moral authorities at all. If that were the thing that would overthrow moral authority altogether, 
then certainly within the Lutheran tradition, starting with Luther's own personal life, yeah. uh, and at other traditions, you would have to say there is no moral authority in the world. Hmm. I don't think that's the case. And really at the core is a doubting that the Holy Spirit is truly leading the church. I mean, in, this, in, in the historical church, that the, that the Spirit wasn't there, it wasn't guiding or turned its back on the church as people turned. Uh, then God turned on the church. I mean, one would have to deny, would have to say that Christ's promise, you know, at some point was it broken. Failed. You, you know that. Mm -hmm. the, so, all right, let's take a break. Come back in just a moment with some of your questions for our guest, Dr. Paul Thigpen. Be back. In a Welcome back. Our guest tonight is Dr. Paul Thigpen. It's always a pleasure to have Paul with us here on The Journey Home. We've got another email, or question, or caller. Let's go with our phone caller first. George from Alabama, what's your question? Hi, yes, uh, thank you very much for taking my call. I appreciate it. I really uh, enjoy your show quite a bit. Thank Thanks you for, for doing it. Uh, my question has to do, I was wondering what uh, Dr. Thigpen would think about the efforts of the various Jesus seminars in the past to reconstruct uh, Jesus from a historical perspective. Uh, using the same sort of methodology that you would use to uh, examine a historical figure who's dead uh, is used in, 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 as a way I understand it, uh, to uh, evaluate uh, uh, Jesus from a historical perspective, perspective who's very much alive. And uh, would like to know what, uh, what your thoughts on that are. Thank you, George. George, I, we could go on for a whole evening about this, and it's, that's an excellent question. I, uh, my, I did my graduate work at Emory University in, in Atlanta, and uh, there's someone on the faculty there named uh, Dr. Luke Timothy Johnson. And I think if you'll just uh, put his name in uh, your Google search engine on, online and check out the things that he's written, books, articles, that kind of thing, that he's done a wonderful job of demolishing the, the uh, suppositions, the assumptions, the conclusions for the most part of the Jesus Seminar. So we could go into to many details, but I think that the methodology is flawed uh, I think that uh, not just because Jesus is, is a living person, but because there's, I think from the beginning there tends to be a bias uh, against the sources that would support uh, the Orthodox Christian position and uh, a bias in favor of sources from alternative uh, spiritualities, as they might be called, things that the early leaders of the church rejected out of hand as being contrary to the, the common memory of, of the people who passed on the tradition of Jesus. So uh, I don't want to go into a lot of details. We really could spend all evening. But if you look at the, the works of Luke Timothy Johnson, I think you'll find a, a very erudite, very convincing, compelling reply to the Jesus Seminar. And I say that uh, knowing a couple of people on the seminar, uh, one who used to be one of my colleagues, a very fine man and, uh, and a good man, but I, but I think the seminar is, is quite mistaken. All right. Thank you, Paul. Let's take this next email. This comes from Charles. He says, I am a devout Catholic but I've always had some difficulty understanding the importance of the story of Adam and Eve. I know that we must believe that humankind had an origin at a point in history, but are we required to believe in the historicity of Adam and Eve? Were they actual persons or metaphors for human origin in time? Thank you, Charles. Well, we're moving out of my area of church history now. <laughs> uh, I, what I would do is refer you to the catechism. It's very carefully worded there. We can. It is true we can speak of our first parents. We can speak of uh, Adam and Eve and, and that story as representing an historical event, a true historical event. But as the Catechism puts it, we have to recognize that there is some figurative language there. Now, to what extent that is, is uh, something that the church has not determined in detail. And until the church determines it in detail, I certainly won't, won't speak on that. But there are, uh, there are a number of things that we learn from that and that we have to remember. And one is, yes, that the human race did have a a particular origin did have uh, a certain set of parents first. We didn't come about as some uh, modern archaeologists and anthropologists think by having uh, 
different races come about and, and be separate. That's very important because there, especially in Nazi ideology and other ideologies that have been racist, there have been attempts to say that human, that, that not everyone we would consider human today really has the same origin, that they've come from different species and therefore it's, uh, it's certainly fine for one species to dominate the other because the other is, is simply an animal of some sort. And uh, I, I don't think I'm exaggerating when I say that the church, especially during the period of, of Nazi ideology coming to, to power in Europe, that was one of the points they wanted to make from the book of Genesis and from that story, to remember that the church has insisted, in part based on Genesis and other revelation, that we all do belong to one human family. We have first parents. And that there was a fall. We were not created the way we are now, that there was a fall. And that in Adam, all have sinned in, in a certain way, that original sin is true. We have the roots of, of that doctrine and that story as well. So lots of important things there trying to, uh, to debate the first chapter versus the second chapter where you have different order of events and that kind of thing, f for me have been rather fruitless. But I read the story and it, it touches me very deeply. I've been doing genealogy recently and uh, remarkably because my family eventually connects up to a couple of royal families in Europe and the royal families tended to keep better genealogies than, than most of us. I've been able to go very far back and when I began to realize how many people I'm related to, <laughs> uh, it's, uh, it was an eye-opener. It, it, it gave kind of a concrete nature to this notion that all men and women really are brothers and sisters. We really do all go back to the same parents. And that's something we must never forget. Every time we, we get on a bus and we look at somebody sitting next to us or we, we walk down the street or we look at a colleague or a student or a teacher, uh, we look at our enemy, we have to remember that they have the same parents we do. We all go back to, to our first parents. And if we can get that down, the book of Genesis will have done a great deal for us. I mean, on the one hand, the church allows this, this freedom within bounds of dealing with how to understand Genesis 1 and 2. But when it comes down to it, we look at the way the theology is brought out. John Paul, for example, he has a book called, I think it's called Love and Responsibility. I think that's the title. I think where it's a collection of his Wednesday addresses over a long period of time, in which he uses Adam and Eve and, and the Genesis story as a foundation for his uh, understanding of the body. And, and there's no apology for John Paul. It, speaking of Adam and Eve as historical figures with a historical act of disobedience and the ramifications of that. And of course, we see that uh, literalness in the teachings of Jesus as well as the, the New Testament writers. So, you know, there's one thing about looking at, the, you know, the, the range in which we can understand mm -hmm. that, but there's the, there's the true application of them as historical figures as a foundation for our theology. Let's go to Tom in Illinois. Hello, Tom. What's your question tonight? Hello. Hello. Um, I've enjoyed your comments about how you, uh, about being a student of history, to be a student of the church. And my question is, um, can't I remain a Protestant and still enjoy the Church Fathers and uh, the sacred writings that uh, so many of the notable Christians of the last 2,000 years have written? Uh, can't I remain um, in, in the uh, branch of the faith that I'm in? Thank you, Tom, for question. Thanks, Tom. That's a good question. You can certainly learn a great deal, surely, from the church fathers and from others. The question that comes to all of us is, uh, is the basic question of truth. We mentioned this earlier. I, uh, I, th I think I started out looking at the Catholic Church because I, of my love for history and connectedness and rootedness and that kind of thing. But when somebody finally asked me you know, at a later time, why did you become Catholic? What I, the only answer I really could give was because I believe that what the Catholic Church teaches is true. I believe that what the Church teaches about itself and the claims it makes for itself are true. And if they are, then Jesus wants me to be, be Catholic. And it was by reading the Church Fathers especially that, that I came to that conclusion. So for instance, in my own tradition, as much as I loved it, as much as I learned from it, wonderful people in it, learned a great deal about loving God, about the Scripture, uh, when they thought that the Eucharist was only a symbol of the body and blood. When I read what St. Ignatius and St. Clement, the folks who had actually learned their faith from the apostles said about it, I mean, not to speak of what Jesus himself said in the scripture, but that they, they made it very clear, they said, and those who say that it's not the very same body and blood that was crucified for us, they've separated from us. 
uh, things like that, I, I began to realize that if I wanted to be in continuity w with Jesus in that way, if I wanted to affirm the truth as he taught it, I didn't really have the liberty of turning away from that. And there were enough major issues, like the Eucharist, uh, in which I, I came to conclude that it's not that I couldn't enjoy or, or benefit from reading all these folks from history, but that, I guess to put it in a strong way, that if I continued with certain doctrines that I believed, and if I continued outside the organizational visible structure of the Catholic Church, that according to the judgment of people like St. Ignatius, St. Clement, St. Augustine, I was putting myself outside uh, certain bounds that God didn't want me out of. All right, thank you, Paul. Let's go with another email. This is Jeff in Jacksonville, Florida. Hello, Marcus and Paul. I am a fan of the Journey Home and of EWTN. I am not Catholic, however, and I have been working to learn as much as I can about the Catholic faith. I watch EWTN often. I am currently attempting to understand the catechism. I am seriously interested in taking an RCIA class at a local church. There are several Catholic churches in my area, and I am unsure what to look for. What makes a good RCIA course? And what can I expect from this instruction? Thank you, Jeff. Good question. Huh, That's Paul? an excellent question. You might be able to answer better than I. I've taught RCI. You can come on up to Savannah, and uh, <laughs> we'll, we'd love to give you a great RCI class at our parish. But uh, I think what you want, especially as you're already a Christian, you, you know a lot of, uh, of Bible, probably, and doctrine. Uh, there are some RCI classes in parishes that tend to focus I think too much on feelings and feeling good and that kind of thing. And you go to them and what you hear again and again is, is Jesus loves you and he loves all people and you know, he wants you to, to be joined with him. And, and those things are true. But if you go to an RCIA class where you're not getting Catholic doctrine, yeah. the things that you need to know, then you probably need to find another RCIA class. You need to, uh, if, if you're asking questions when you go to an RCIA class and you say, well, what is what is the Catholic doctrine of the Eucharist, or what do Catholics teach about the Immaculate Conception? If your answer from the teacher is something like, well, those things aren't really very important, or what's really important is just that Jesus loves you, you need to find another class, because you really need to know what the Catholic distinctives are. Uh, would it also be important for him to get a, a, a good, dependable, trustworthy sponsor? Oh, that's critical, yeah. Someone, someone who knows the faith, someone who's... Uh, who's devout, someone who has a, a deep prayer life, all those things are, are so and important. And can help you when you are yes. at RCIA to make sure you're, they are teaching what's true because this is a, you know, a well-trained, faithful Catholic who's standing with you to make sure that what's being taught is true. And the third thing is make sure you have the Catholic, Catholic Catechism, Catechism of the Catholic Church, and read it. Uh, you're, if you're an adult, you, you may have to go slow in some parts, but it is accessible, it is readable. Go through it, ask questions of the RCI teacher. Again, if they can't help you, uh, come back to a, a source that can. There are online sources. There are others that can. A catechism, a good sponsor, and a teacher who's not afraid to talk about distinctive Catholic beliefs and practices. All right. Thank you, Paul. Let's take our next email. Ron, dear Marcus and Dr. Thigpen, what response would you give to Protestants who say the Marian beliefs were added by the church in response to goddess worship in the culture in which the early church found itself? Oh my, we could spend another <laughs> evening talking about that. Because we haven't the, heard that, both of that before in our, yes. in our previous... Though the church may have defined Marian doctrines, uh, dogmas, uh, later in its life, it was, uh, what usually has happened in the history of the church is that dogmas, teachings are defined once they've been thoroughly challenged. That uh, these, kind, these, these kinds of teachings typically are in the church for a long, long time, and then someone comes up and says, that's not true. And then lots of people begin to believe them. And the church has to take a step back and say, okay, it is true. We're, we're saying it authoritatively, and here's why. That's what happened with Marcion, the canon. We, the, the scriptural canon that we have, the list of books, uh, was provoked, you might say, by someone who rejected the books that the church was teaching. So I think what you have to, to see is to look back through church history into early times and see what people had to say mm -hmm. about Our Lady and see that even in the early centuries they were already talking about her uh, unique purity. They were talking about uh, prayer to her. They were, uh, early on we have uh, a record of an apparition and all kinds of things. So that when the church defined these things later, it was simply giving its affirmation in a definitive way 
to what the church had taught and believed. So it's not new things. Goddess worship uh, was something totally from the outside. Believe me, if there was anybody who wanted to push away, cut away yeah. goddess teachings and pagan teachings, it was the early Christians. And again, that, that calls us to get back in touch with history because you can read these documents which are available from these middle centuries that talk about the fine-tuning of some of these teachings because of uneducated laity or maybe as not as well-educated priests who were drawing people away and they're called heretics and so you see the church getting together in councils bringing people back to understand they, they fought over how to understand Mary I think you know you have to be careful to in saying that just because Mary has an exalted position that sounds a little bit like pagan goddess worship then one must have led to the other you get those kind of claims in Tim LaHaye and, and Jerry Jenkins books yeah. left behind books uh, that kind of idea that somehow the Catholic Church is Babylon and teaches Babylon but you always you have to remember that there are parallel developments there there were uh, not even theologians but non-Christians who have tried to make the argument that Jesus is just another version of the corn king who died and was resurrected yeah. why because in pagan religion you've got very similar stories or or the the cult of Mithras yeah. had a sacred meal and so they say oh see communion was just an imitation of this pagan sacred meal and if you're Christian, I don't think you want to take that step. I don't think you want to say that just because they're very uh, tangential parallels in the pagan tradition, that somehow that's where Christianity got it. And again, that all denies the fulfillment of Christ's promise, that he gave the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, to the apostles to guide them into truth. And trusting that that's what the Spirit did in these really key, important yes. doctrines. Trusting that. You throw that out the window, you end up with all these other views, and pretty, pretty soon you have nothing left. But it's trusting, I mean, where's the authority to determine what's true? We believe it's in the spirit that guides the church. Let's take our next caller, Teresa in Indiana. What's your question? Yeah, thank you for taking my call. I teach an apologetics class for our local parish, and oh, we will be covering um, the rapture belief in, um, in one of our sessions this fall. And I'm reading Dr. Thigpen's The Rapture Trap right now to help me prepare. And my question for Dr. Thigpen is, what do you think um, my class is only an hour, hour and a half, so I can't get everything in there. But what do you think are the most important things to highlight um, about the Catholic teaching about the end times and, and how the rapture is um, not true? All right, Teresa, especially if you get there and your whole class is gone, you'll wonder, did they get, you know. <laughs> did you but, get left behind? That's right. <laughs> there, uh, we do, Ascension Press, that publishes that book, also has a, a short version of it you might want to check out that would be perfect to just go through in an hour. But I'll say these things. Uh, number one, it's very important to help folks uh, understand coming from a Protestant background uh, especially that this is not a Catholic Protestant argument that the majority of Christians both Catholic and Protestant and Orthodox throughout the history of the church have known nothing of a rapture doc secret rapture doctrine so you've got to help them understand this is not just something that Catholics cooked up uh, you can take them back to uh, Martin Luther founder of the Reformation to John Calvin to Wesley who founded the the Methodist tradition and uh, Ulrich Zwingli with some of the reformed tradition, not a one of them had any clue that anybody could out of the scripture get this notion of a secret rapture. So that's very important. The second thing is to help them understand that it is a very recent notion, that we don't ha have any real documentation of the, the current notion being around until the beginning of the 1800s, maybe a couple of similar ideas in the, the 1700s, but it's a, it's a very novel idea that most of, uh, all of the church fathers all the medieval theologians, all the great Reformation leaders, and folks up until that time would look at it and say, that's just crazy. Yeah. Where does that come from? Then I think you would uh, you'd take them, use the, the passages in the book that I noted, to take them to the places in Matthew 24, in First and Second Thessalonians that are often used by rapture believers. And using the things that I have in the book, show them how those passages don't apply to a secret rapture at all, but simply to the second coming of Christ in glory, which all the Christians agree with. And I would hope that you'd have at least a few minutes at the end of the class then to make sure that you go over the main points of what the Catholic Church does teach, mm -hmm. to make sure they understand especially that the Catholic Church does not deny the second coming of Christ by any means, but denies that there will be a third in-between coming, a secret mm -hmm. rapture, because there's some Protestants who use the word rapture indiscriminately between the secret idea and the final coming. And if you say we don't teach the rapture, they'll think you mean you don't believe Jesus is coming back. So make sure you do say what the Catholic Church does teach in one of the last chapters of my book, I have just a, a few points from the catechism with the re references to the catechism. 
So even in that sense, the, if, the, if the teacher uses your book, but the students have the catechism and scriptures, she can lead them through those two. That's right. And one other thing I, I will say is that the rapture doctrine uh, has a very mistaken notion of suffering in, the, uh, in its role in the Christian life. And you need to help folks to see the one reason the rapture doctrine is so attractive to people is that it promises them an escape from the great tribulation at the end of time. And part of what you have to help them to see is all through the scripture and all through church history, God uses suffering as a, as a way of cleansing us and purifying us and that the innocent do suffer for the guilty in a way that joins our sufferings to Christ. All right. Let's take our next caller. This is Pamela from Texas. Hello, Pamela. What's your question for us tonight? Uh, hi, Marcus. Hi, Wonderful program. Thank, Thank you, you for taking my call. Yep. I recently, for the first time, I'm a Catholic, but I've just read the Old Testament for the first time. And first it was just a liter literature exercise for me. Uh, and then more seriously, I reread it. And both times I've been astounded and don't know quite how to handle the feelings that I have towards God the Father, who seems to me arbitrarily nasty. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, genocide is the Canaanites, the bulls, everything yeah. is just over the top for me. And yeah. how does one deal with feelings of quite frankly, dislike for this father figure that I thought was totally different from Jesus. Thank you, Pamela. Thank you. Oh, well, Pamela, that's an excellent question. I was just talking to someone the other day as a result of some of the, the liturgical readings in church about, uh, for instance, with Pharaoh, how God f hardens Pharaoh's heart and then all this calamity comes. And, and it seems like uh, it's a very hard saying. If, uh, if God f hardened his heart, how can he be responsible? And once again, we went back to St. Augustine and, uh, and some of the other church fathers who talked about how that when God moves on, on a person, he, he moves, can move in a certain way that their response then depends on the, the way, the disposition that they have according to previous choices. So that, for instance, uh, in the same way that when sunlight shines on wax, it melts it and makes it soft, but the same sunlight shines on clay, it makes it hard and brittle that you have to realize that even God in his mercy, by giving Pharaoh another chance, another chance, another chance, that kind of mercy for a person who had predisposed their heart the right way would, would melt. But for Pharaoh, because of his previous choices, it hardened. So the scripture says God hardened his heart. But behind that, St. Augustine says, we have to understand that hardened in the sense that his response, that, that God's action led to the hardening, but it was still his response immediately responsible for that. I know that doesn't answer your question about the uh, the wiping out of, of uh, some of the peoples in, in Canaan. And that is difficult to understand, but what it does press me to do is to, to remember that there are, are things in there that are, are dark mysteries. And as C.S. Lewis once said in, in one of his letters, that we must never ever, uh, that we should read the whole scripture, but we should never let any scripture convince us that God is not completely good and in him that there is any darkness at all. And that's why you have to read the New Testament along with it and somehow trust that when we get to heaven, it'll all be explained. That yeah. sounds like a cop-out, but it's, it's, it's a dark thing. We, we can't look into it completely. In fact, I, I mean, there's so many places we go in that because we don't, don't have enough time, but you know, we have Moses doing the best way he can to describe what, how he understood to people who couldn't read, you know, we're not scientifically trained, uh, you know, trying to describe this God. So often they use the anthropomorphic images to describe God. They have, He'd get jealous and turn his mind. Well, does God really change his mind, or is that the way they're perceiving it? There's lots of issues, uh, you know, that deal with that. Um, and uh, I, I think, but again, it draws us back to the issue of being careful of private interpretation. Mm -hmm. We just must be careful of private interpretation, because even the devil can use a passage, and to use our misunderstanding of it to pull us away, to tick away at our, at our heart, make us hardened. Uh, and, but that's why I'm glad you called, you know, that in a sense of uh, find someone else nearby, a priest or someone to, to talk to locally about that passage. And I think, for instance, so you could ask the same question of contemporary situations. Why do all these people die of a plague? Why do all these people, innocent people, die of an earthquake? Why do they die of things like that? Uh, if God is ultimately behind all why things, do children then die the why do children die? And then we make it personal. You know, I, I lost, we, my wife and I lost a child in the womb. If you ask a why of that kind of question, or that kind of question, it, you don't get very far. And in the end, whether it's our own pain, the pain of our neighbors or others, the pain of people 3,000 years ago, what we have to say is, I, I don't know why that 
but I do know that God is good, yeah. that in him is no darkness, and that just as I've seen in my own life that out of great tragedy God is always able to bring a greater good, that somehow it was within his purposes, and I, ha I have to trust him with that. Yeah. If you read John 1, reflect on John 1 about the light of life in Jesus and how those were blinded by the darkness, you know, those that couldn't really see him, he, who did not receive him when he came to them. And we see that image of the Old Testament, but then we see those that received him were then invited to become, given the power to become children of God. I mean, we see this whole New Testament fulfillment, fulfillment of only what they had looked forward to and hoped for in the Old Testament. Let's see if we get one more email in here. It comes from Mark. He says, I just turned 16, so I'm not real up on all my religion and stuff, but the other day I read this story about a frog storm. It was raining frogs. Did this really happen, or does the Bible just exaggerate this kind of stuff? Thanks, Mark. Kind of connects what you were just That's talking great. about. <laughs> it is, it is. Mark, let me tell you, I don't know if you've That's ever... The, That's the Exodus 9. The frog That's right. storm is in the Exodus 9. Don't know, Mark, that you've ever lived in Texas. <laughs> but I have, and I'm here to tell you there are accounts of it raining frogs in Texas. <laughs> and uh, and they're to be believed. I mean, it can actually happen through processes that we know where, I don't know if it's like a tornado or a water spout, brings up frogs into the air and actually drops them on a town or an area and they fall all over the place. That's just to say, I'm not saying that's how it happened. Uh, I'm saying that there are so many things that we don't understand that both have a natural explanation and then have, that have a miraculous yeah. supernatural yeah. explanation. I don't think that's an exaggeration. I, each one of the plagues, if you look at them closely and then you look at ancient Egyptian religion, you see that they were making a statement, not just of annoying the people, but it was showing that the God of, of the Jewish people, the ancient Hebrews, was a greater God than all of these sacred images and gods that the, the Egyptians worshiped. The Nile was sacred, the Nile turns to blood. The sun, Ra, was a God, the sun is darkened. The, the God of the Jewish people is showing himself to be stronger than all of these. And so with each one of them, frogs included, there was a, a special meaning to it. If God chose to just dump frogs out of the sky, if he chose to bring them from Texas from a big twister, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, he can do it. I don't have any problem with that. All right, Paul, how about in closing? How has uh, your Catholic journey uh, brought you closer to Jesus Christ? Oh, my. We need a whole program. But I'll say this one thing. Through the Eucharist, through the Eucharist, being Catholic, having that great treasure of the Catholic Church has brought me closer to Jesus. When I discovered that Jesus, when he ascended into heaven, I didn't have to just wait for him to come back one day in his body and blood and soul and divinity, but that he comes to us every day on the altar. And that if we prepare ourselves to receive him rightly, we can receive him in the most intimate of ways into ourselves. That Jesus comes to me at the altar every day. And that's one powerful way that the church has brought me closer to Jesus. All right, Paul. Thank you very much for joining thank us. Thank you, Marcus. Thank what thank a you pleasure. Thank you for all your work that you do in your publishing world, writing world, and uh, thank you. continued witness, ways in which when before you were Catholic, you never dreamed God would open up all these That's wonderful sure. doors. That's for sure. But thank you very much for joining us. You're always a pleasure. Thank and you. thank you for joining us on the Journey Home program. Uh, again, it's a pleasure to have this great privilege of introducing and well, bringing back converts like Paul Thigpen. Again, I want to remind you that he is an editor for the Catholic Answer magazine, and uh, you might want to pick that up. I have, I have an article in it. Father Ray Ryland has an article. And uh, uh, you know, when I think about all the different questions we had tonight on the program, to me, it, not only the, the importance of history, to understanding what's true, how we learn from history, but the importance of an authority we can trust. We live in a world, we live in a political world today. We have voices in every direction trying to yank and yank us. And the bottom line is, with all the different opinions, how do we determine which one we can trust with our life eternally? And Jesus gave us the answer to that. When he hand chose his apostles, he promised he would give them the Holy Spirit to lead them into all truth. And he said, I will build my church on the rock of Peter. That's the blessing of the church. Thank you for joining us. I'll see you again next week. God bless you.